welcome back to Round the Table. This week brought to you in part by Disaster Heroes. Uh, my daughter and I went to Christchurch last month uh, with the help of Suzanne Bernier and um, Ann Tyndall in Yarram. Uh, during the Hero Roundtable, Yarram, Suzanne led uh, some Stars of Hope painting and uh, the primary school uh, in Yarram was, was happy to have uh, some stars painted. So we took them to Christchurch uh, and quite thankfully uh, were met by uh, Wolfgang Bopp at the Botanic Gardens who was sort of overseeing the memorial there and uh, we were given sort of prime prime spot on the fence at the Botanic Gardens and uh, spent the afternoon uh, putting them up and I'll, I'll let my daughter take it from here. We're here putting the stars up that we painted here in Christchurch and as you can see we are adding to a very large memorial of flowers, cards and signs. Okay so we're going to show you the process of putting these up. This is one of the, the stars and it says Joy up here and then it was made by Diana and Ruby. So thanks to Stars of Hope, thanks to Suzanne, to Anne, uh, and especially the grade four, uh, threes and fours at Yarram Primary School for their work. Um, the, uh, the Botanic Gardens is going to be keeping some of those Stars of Hope in a permanent display. Um, we also did get out to the Linwood Islamic Centre um, and left some stars there. So all in all, a uh, very quick trip. It was uh, there and back again. Uh, and um, this week's show then is uh, with a former Hero Roundtable speaker, uh, Mel Yates. Uh, she is in Tasmania, uh, has spent a lot of time around this country uh, busking for a purpose, but I will leave her to tell you all about that. And so uh, once again, thanks to people in Christchurch for welcoming us in uh, and the people that helped us get over there. Uh, it's something we won't forget. Uh, very easily. So on with the show. Um, welcome to the Round the Table vl vlog. Um, our guest this week is Mal Yates, uh, speaking to us from Tasmania. Are you? Yes, you're in Tasmania at the moment, in Hobart? Yeah, yeah, I'm in Hobart. So Mel um, spoke at the last Yarram Hero Roundtable and has a, a fascinating story of deciding to do something. Um, so, Mel, can you maybe set the scene for us? Um, where where were you? Where what what's happened to make make your life change and start being what it is now? I suppose. Uh, I think it was twenty sixteen, and I was sitting on the couch, and there was a news report about this guy called Samuel Johnson, who had just played in the Molly Meldrum TV series, uh, and. There was a bit of a stink um, because he decided to quit acting and and focus on fundraising for his charity love your sister um, and uh, it got me thinking like what what could i kind of do to to help raise some money and to help with the fight with cancer um, so I, I jumped online to google and and googled samuel johnson and it turns out he's not just a guy who acted he's the he unicycled around Australia and raised over a million dollars that year, which was amazing. So kind of inspired me to, to think about what I could do. And I've, I'd been playing guitar for about three or four years and decided, you know, maybe I'll, I'll try busking and raise 20 grand in, in 20 months. So it, it kind of started from that. Yeah. So it's interesting that kind of, um, instance that, that, that moment, um, I think a lot of people have that. A lot of people are sitting on the couch watching TV and they see something and they think, oh, what could I do? Yeah. Have you got any insight into why you think that was something that spoke to you enough that you actually started planning and then, and then more importantly, doing? Yeah, I, I don't really have anything that um, pushed me over the edge. It was more of a, hey, I think I'll do this, so 
why not? I was kind of in between jobs. So I, I worked six months at the ski fields and then six months doing whatever I could uh, in between on the off season. So, um, yeah, time for a sea change and, and decided to um, make my way around Australia. And so you did that, um, and and we'll talk we'll talk about that. But what's so? This is the sort of the next hard part of these kinds of stories. Is yeah, you've you've said I'm going to do something. You've worked out what it is, what it's yep. going to be. You had a, a goal: twenty months, twenty thousand yeah. dollars. What were your next steps? Like, were you you were off at that point? You weren't working uh, on the ski slope, so you were you were there. How did you how did you plan that? How did you start making it happen? Uh, the first step was to write an email to Sam, and um, I didn't think that he would be the one replying, but uh, he actually called me up straight away and said, "Hey, we'd love to get you on board. Um, what can we do to help?" And I said, "Oh, your support would be great, and I'd love to do a fundraiser at Mount Hotham because um, I was doing another one more season um, while I saved up to go around Australia." Um, the first time I tried busking was outside Bright Woolies and I raised about $84 for about an hour busking. So, um, yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> and you, so you, were you living in Bright at that point? I was, yes. Yeah. Yep. And so you had, you came up with this idea to busk around Australia for 20 months and you had not yet busked. No, <laughs> not yet. So That's uh, fascinating. Yeah. I spent, um, the Easter weekend, um, just busking and busking and seeing how much I could actually raise and um, had a little sign saying that I was raising money for mental health and for cancer research and um, people would literally empty their wallets into my guitar case so yeah that's that's a pretty good start (laughs) so how did the mental health uh, component come into the fundraising uh, mental health is a big part of um, big part of my life. I went through depression for five or six years straight. Um, in year nine, I had two friends killed um, when a tree landed on their tent during school camp. So um, that you know, you're you're 15 years old, trying to find your place in the world already, and then like your life literally comes crashing down. Um, and whilst one funeral is really hard to go through, two in one day was just devastating for me so I kind of lost my way for for a few years and stopped studying and stopped communicating with friends and family so yeah and so okay so that that's that it's interesting that you um you were sort of spurred to action by someone raising money for cancer but then quickly realized there was there was a a cause closer to your heart yeah yeah which I imagine helps keep you keep you going on the road um so how long before or how long after the easter busking test did you hit the road uh so i had one more season at mount hotham so i didn't actually hit the road till about october 2016 um and then by that time i'd actually reached 20 grand um so sam came up for a fundraiser and um, he's like, okay, so since you've hit your 20 grand target, how about we raise it to 100,000? And I was said, challenge accepted. And <laughs> yeah, went from there. So the 20,000 came in one season in, in Mount, at Mount Hotham and in, in Bright. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, had a couple of fundraisers and had some friends at Hotham jump on board, and which was really amazing. Uh, and then, yeah, if people were fundraising for help uh, to help me raise that 20 grand as well so yeah it kind of brought this community together wow and so how were you communicating that or were you other than just turning up and and busking and then running these fundraisers were you was it taking up a lot of your time where you were focused on getting the word out or was it sort of just happening organically uh I think it all kind of just came together somehow. I, I didn't really have to push it too much. Um, I had a little handmade sign um, that I had up each time I was busking, so that kind of caught people's attentions. They, uh, they'd walk past and then stop, read the sign and walk back and um, empty out their wallets. <laughs> so, yeah. And kinda, uh, how did you convince people that that was a legitimate uh, yeah. fundraiser? Because it's easy to, to make a sign, right? So how were you – was there – Was there a component to it that convinced people, it showed people that this was a legitimate fundraising effort? Yeah, uh, I had um, 
authority to fundraisers from um, Beyond Blue and Love Your Sister, um, if anyone did ask. But, yeah, most of the time people would just um, believe that I was fundraising, and I was, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, that helps, yeah. Well, okay, so, and I'm asking lots of specific questions because I think it can help people get over that initial bump of, I want to do this, but I have no idea and there's no way I could possibly do it. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think it's important to showcase people like you who didn't have that background, didn't have even any busking experience, and then you and you made it happen. Um, so then that that goal was given to you as a, for a hundred thousand, which was again tied to going around Australia. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. And so, tell me how that all happened. How did you map <laughs> out? Did you map out? Like, was there a route that you were taking? How did you? How did you how did you jump onto a hundred thousand and think yeah okay I'll just get around Australia and make that happen? <laughs> Honestly, I didn't really have a plan. Um, it everything kind of, as I said before kind of fell into place. Um, I was on ABC Radio saying you know I'm a girl, her car and her guitar, but I don't actually have a car yet. <laughs> um, and one of the listeners that day called me up and said that his aunt had just passed away from cancer. And my story had touched his heart and he actually owned a rental company in Shepparton uh, and he would love to offer me a year a free rental for a car to use right around Australia, um, which was amazing. So <laughs> I had a car and a guitar and decided to yeah set up and kind of go around Australia. Um, I had a, I have a Facebook page called, it's now called A Girl and Her Guitar because I don't have a car anymore. Um, <laughs> But people would email me straight away and say, look, if you're coming through this town, um, we'd love you to stay. So I kind of planned my trip around the people that I could stay with, if that makes sense. Yeah. So the the, the getting a car from a rental company is certainly a, a um, stress reducer compared with buying a $500 car and hoping it's going to make it make its way around. Yeah, totally. Um, but I think the one of one of the uh, another hero round table speaker Casper Craven told me last year that it's really important when you're doing something like this to tell people what you need um, mm. and it doesn't sound like you deliberately did that but it, the fact that you made it made people aware that you needed a car allowed people to give you a car and it's if they don't know that they're not going to offer that and I yeah. think it's 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 a really important part of when people are trying to do something in the world that they let other people know what they need to make it happen because as you've seen, um, people love to jump on and help someone who's who's making a big effort like that. Mm, yeah, definitely. I mean, as I, I was even when I was busking in the street, people would come up because they'd been following my story, and they'd give me, you know, fifty dollars for donation, but also fifty dollars petrol or food money as well, just to help me get around Australia. Nice. Yeah. So that that I've heard sort of similar stories where. Um, people have started a, a movement like this and your um, fellow speaker in Yarram, Matthew Winkler, yeah. had a story of, of travelling around America and all of a sudden he wasn't having to worry about where to stay because people were offering it to him. Yeah. Um, and social media is great at that. Did yes. you make an effort to get people to the page? Like how, does, how did people find your page that were in another state who could then say, hey, come and stay with us? Yeah, um, I was contacted by the ABC 730 report um, and they actually did a little segment on me um, probably a, a February, March 2017 and from that I got a few thousand followers. Um, so it kind of went big from there and also Love Your Sister had quite a big following too uh, and they did a couple of posts. So that, that really helped as well. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah, being on national television always helps with these sorts yeah. of things. Yeah. Um, so, as how long did it take you to get to that hundred k? Uh, it took another twelve months from the August that I left. Yeah. So, what are some of the the highlights of that trip? What 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 do you? So that was sorry, I'll let you answer the question. But that was basically <laughs> the year of two thousand and seventeen. Yeah, pr pretty much. So I think I left December 1st was the actual year on the road um, till December 1st, the next year, 2017. Um, and I had a big fundraiser in November the 11th at 
the Brunswick Hotel and reached my hundred thousand dollars at uh, that date. So right. it kind of all, yeah. Um, yeah. So a year on the road. What's what are some of the the highlights? Uh, so there's a little town called Wombat, uh, which was probably my favourite little town to to visit. It had 120 people in the population of the town. And I think 125 people turned up for my fundraiser. <laughs> um, and uh, per per person per town that that donated, I think ten dollars per person donated from that town, which was amazing. Whereas in Sydney, you'd get like 0. 0.005 of a cent. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, the little towns kind of became the 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 biggest fundraisers for me. Um, I guess because they are such a big community that every story, they all have a story that has touched their hearts of, of cancer or mental health or, or both in a lot of cases. So um, I guess it's easier in a smaller town to, to get that fundraising happening. Yeah. And so did someone from Wombat bring you in then or did you just happen to land there one day? Yeah, no, and a lovely gentleman called Matt who'd um, been a fan of Love Your Sister as well. He he contacted me and said, like, we'd love to do a fundraiser for you. That's great. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. you can imagine when it is one person in a small community like that, they can really get everyone get everyone up for something. Totally, yeah. Um, more often than not, I'd be busking in, in the local pub um, and staying in the local pub as well um, just to do a free gig and, and, and raise awareness as well. Um and it's talking to the locals that you kind of get to know um, or, or, or fundraise a bit better. Um, in Tenterfield, I'd, I'd been busking at, at a hotel and then some people came up and said, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? We'd love you to come around to our house. We're having a party. Um, we'll raise you a few, you know, a couple of hundred there. So, yeah, word of mouth really helped. Yeah, yeah. And, and what... Um... What was your repertoire like as you're traveling for 12 months? Were you were you trying to change it up for your own sanity or were you pretty much rolling out some stock stock popular songs? There are a lot of songs that were asked all the time. Um, Ed Sheeran had just released the Divide album, um, so I was playing a lot of Ed Sheeran and getting a lot, asked a lot. Um, and, you know, the golden oldies like Jack and Diane and, and Father and Son and things like that. So, yeah, it... I, I mean, it, it's if I did the same set, it songs that I knew, so it, it would go well. And if I tried to change it up, depending on how drunk the the people were, um, sometimes they'd join in for a sing as well. So. <laughs> right, right. Oh, well, we, so yeah. Um, so what's what's happened since? So you got to twelve months. You made a hundred thousand uh, for for an amazing pair of charities. So what what have you done since? I worked for Love Your Sister for about six months um, and through them we released a, a sock range and raised about a million dollars worth of socks wow. for cancer research, Yeah, um, which was really amazing and um, unfortunately I, I left after about six months to, to do my own thing and moved down to Hobart and here I am working for an amazing company. Excellent. Yeah. So have you have you got the bug where you think that's you're going to be doing these sort of amazing big chunk of life uh things in the, in the future <laughs> yeah definitely i'm actually uh in the process with a couple of charities to to actually do another trip around australia at you know, over the next year or so so there there are some plans in the works already which i'm really excited but i, I can't release them yeah yet. yeah yeah of course <laughs> So what do you think um, was some of the characteristics that you had that enabled you to do that, to be living on the road for 12 months, to be putting yourself out there, to be um, meeting new people regularly? What, how did you pull that off? Because I don't, I'm not sure that it, everyone could do it. Yeah, I think it's just um, a sense of that I could actually, like having that mentality that I can actually do something that I put my mind to. Um, and then just all the support from around Australia and even from overseas as well, um, that any time that I was down, they'd lift me back up. Um, on my page, I, I hid nothing. Um, like if I was having a down day, um, I'd let them know. And more than often than not, I'd have a stranger come up and give me a random hug. <laughs> so yeah, that was pretty amazing. Um, like 
for example, one day I, I was busking in, in Albury, New South Wales, and uh, I turned my back on my guitar case for, for uh, a minute or so and turned around and all the, all the notes had been taken out of the guitar case. Um, and I said, look, guys, I'm so sorry that I've let you down. Um, you know, I've had about oh, $70 stolen from my case. Um, oh, I'm really sorry. Like, um, I hope I can make it up to you. And people actually logged onto my GoFundMe and donated $75 and $100 straight away. Um, so I ended up with an extra $700 from just that post, which was amazing. Yeah. And tell me about the what what your sense or feeling of responsibility was to to that audience because you they're obviously still there too so they are. what's um are they do, do you feel a weight of expectation do you feel obliged to them and and how do you manage that yeah they definitely keep me accountable for sure um but yeah, so if I if I go quiet for a couple of weeks, I, I get a few messages from from people who follow my story saying, "Hey, hope you're okay. Um, just haven't heard from you for a while." And um, it's really cool that they they actually care and check in. Um, it's it's yeah, a really lovely feeling to to have those people like strangers who I've probably not even met as well, um, who who just want to know how you're doing. Um, and and the same is reverse as well. Like if I if I no, one of my followers hasn't really been active much and I haven't heard from them for a while. I just check in too. So it goes both ways, which is really lovely. Yeah, it's definitely a, the, the, a feature of online communities that, that there's mm. that support there and, and people really paying attention. Um, so going back to when you were going to go away for 12 months and, and be on the road for 12 months, did you have a pretty good idea of how that was going to work? Did you, or did you just sort of jump in and make it work? Because I think again, that uh, planning session or, or, or the, the the intimidation of such a big um, commitment mm. can really put a lot of people off. So how how did you manage that? I spent actually spent a lot of time talking with Sam about his own trip around Australia. Um, and how he organised it and what he did to kind of get the funds rolling in um, to raise a million dollars. And um, he, he gave me some advice and said, look, um, you know, don't contact the towns too far in advance. Do it about three weeks out and you'll get more of a response because it's not so urgent that they're going to say no um, and it's not so early that they're, they're going to forget about it. So, that yeah, that three-week mark kind of really helped um, and I just email every single pub and every single cafe in the town and say, hey, my name's Mel Yates. I'm busking for charity. I'd love to do a free gig in exchange for a meal or accommodation. And yeah, more often than not, I'd get a reply back and say, yep, yeah, we'd love to have you. Right. Did you um, pick a direction around the country? Were you bopping around from place to place? How did that? How did oh, you do yeah. that? Yeah, I, I ended up traveling 35,000 kilometers in 12 months. So, uh, and that's not including flights as well to get from place to place as well. Um, so it was a lot of driving by myself, um, which I really got used to and really enjoyed being on the road because when you're a fundraiser, you've got so many people um, talking to you and wanting to know your story. And it was a bit hard to begin with because I'd have to talk about my friend's death every single day. Um, and it got me down to begin with, but um, yeah, again, the support from everyone was fantastic. Mm. But um, yeah, so people would say, hey, we want to do a fundraiser for you. Can you come play? And I'd kind of try and work it so I'd be there at that time. Right. Yeah. So that's really good to hear that you got advice. Um, and I think that's an important component too, that a lot of times when people think they want to do something they just assume they've got to do it by themselves, and and as we know, all all of the great stories um, have have the hero of the story looking to other people and getting advice and having a mentor, yeah. and it's such an important 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 piece, and having that team to support you as well. So, have you had people approach you since then to say, "Hey, I want to do something similar"? If so, you know, how, and if you haven't, imagine what your advice would be. But what, <laughs> what is the advice for for people who? want to do a big sort of statement um, thing for the world or for, for, for other people? 
Yeah, um, I think my first advice would be to give it a go because if you don't try, it's, it's already not going to happen. Um, but I had a, a, quite a few people contact me to do a fundraiser um, and as, you know, it was kind of a bit stop and start to begin with. Like I didn't really know how to do a fundraiser and um, having the Love Your Sister charity behind you was was really good because you could ask them advice and raffles and, and prizes and how how could we raise uh, a lot of money in, in just, you know, a three-hour period or something like that. So I guess I became more experienced as you went along um, and I figured out what worked and what didn't, if that makes sense. Yeah. So um, raffles really worked and anything involving alcohol always works. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that the other part there is that you had that organisation behind you. Um, mm. And I think it's it's easy too for people to think, well, I've got to do this by myself. I'm, I'm the one who's who can do this and no one else is doing it. I think a bit of research sometimes can help people realise that there are, there are lots of hours of uh, work put into exactly the kind of thing you want to do. You just have to find those people and... Um, Either, either work with them or get advice or work beside yeah. them or whatever it might be. Mm, definitely. And getting the word out that you are fundraising for a certain cause as well. Um, I had Beyond Blue write out, uh, oh, what are they called? Um, statements to the press uh, to say that, you know, this chick's coming around and yep. raising money. Um, and I did a, about 100 interviews or on radio or TV or, or newspapers uh, on that year. So, yeah. Um, yeah, the exposure was really, really amazing. And I guess that's part of it too, is it's not it's not just going to play some gigs. It's really, there was a lot more work involved um, yeah. in, in doing the press relations the um, and act, the actively seeking out places to perform, right? Yeah, definitely. Uh, it was sometimes it'd be hard to find a place um, to busk or they'd want to charge you like $50 for just an hour. Um, but luckily most hotels would pick me up and I'd be able to do a gig um, once I actually opened for uh, the um, Keith Urban and Taylor Swift tribute band. <laughs> so that was that was really, really fun. Um, a couple of hundred people there and all, all singing along, which was amazing. Yeah, it, it's, yeah, it, I can imagine. I, I mean, I, yeah, I can vaguely <laughs> imagine what kind of experiences you had um, yeah. or the, the sum of them. So um, I think that, that, that going back to that first moment on the couch too, I think that it, it wasn't so much that it was raising money for cancer that got you off the couch literally, but it was that someone had done something, right? It wasn't, mm. it, you weren't drawn to the, the, the cancer fundraising as much as you were to, I've got some time, I'm a person, I can do something to help people. Yeah. Um, I can do something like that. Does that sound right? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, over the years, I'd always raise money for charity, but never to the point of $100,000. Um, but I just wanted to bump it up to the next level and, and set my sights on 20 grand and, and hit hit it. So, yeah, it just gets bigger and bigger. So that's interesting. You've ha you had a history of raising money. So tell me about that. What, what uh sort of things were you doing? Uh, well, so the cancer side of things comes from my cousin who's had cancer twice. Um, the second time he had a bone marrow transplant and it attacked his lungs, uh, meaning that he had to have a double lung transplant. Um, sorry, when he had a bone marrow transplant, he had to, it, he, sorry, <laughs> he ended up having to have that double lung transplant. And um, after that, he was running marathons and triathlons and just, he's, a big inspiration for my trip as well um and cancer's been through my family too so sam's story touched my heart because his sister connie was dying of cancer at the time um so yeah i can i guess that kind of motivated me to get up off the couch and do something about it but so you had done some fundraising for cancer previously sorry yes in other ways yeah so what, yes. what sort of things were you doing so my cousin had cancer and so I decided to shave my hair off um, the first time that he he got it and I raised about uh, $3,000 um, and then the second time he got it, I 
raised another fifteen hundred dollars by shaving my hair off again. I have I have this thing about shaving my hair off because I don't I don't really care about my hair or my looks or or anything like that. So yeah. Right. Right. So that that's that's an important part of the story, I think, because it is that. <clears throat> the building the starting small and Mm. raising three thousand dollars is not small by any means but (laughs) but the when you do sort of as you said kind of have a go have a go at something small um Mm. first get the practice feel get a feel for it um then you can aim higher you can reach higher it's easier to imagine going from three to 20 and then 20 to 100 than it is from zero to 100 right yeah, totally. Um, I mean, I did over a hundred gigs on that year on the road um, and raised a hundred thousand dollars. So um, it's a, on average a thousand dollars per gig, you know. Um, but it was like little bits here and there. Some days it'd be fifty dollars, and other days it'd be fifteen thousand. So yeah, every little bit helps. Some people would be like, "Oh, I've only got twenty-five cents," and I'd be like, "If everyone chucked in twenty-five cents." How much would I have raised? You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I'm. We're going to close off here, but I want to get give you a chance to give people some words of encouragement if they are <laughs> watching this and having that on the couch and having that same kind of feeling. Um, what are your words of wisdom, uh, encouragement, but also how can people get in touch with you if they've got questions? Obviously shout out your Facebook page and wherever else you are on social media and let people know. Yeah, definitely. Um, give it a go. Um, cause as I said before, you, you're going to fail if you don't try. Um, and if you do have any questions or, or are stuck of what you want to do or how to fundraise, give me a, give me a shout. My email's, uh, gcg.mel at gmail.com or Facebook. It's, um, a girl and her guitar and Instagram mel.yates. Fantastic. So yeah. um, people can get on there and start following you to see what's next when you have the big announcement. And Definitely. Um, yeah, I'd encourage anyone, if, you, if you're thinking about doing something, get in touch with Mel because uh, <laughs> there's, there's some inspiration for you for sure. Yeah. Thank you, Mel, for coming on the show. And uh, I'll, um, yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Definitely. Thanks so much for having me. Cool. Anytime. Anytime.